Great. Thanks, Maya. Um, and thanks, folks, for joining us today. I'm Dan Kilborn, one of the foresters working in the northeastern part of the state for VLT. I'm calling in today from Island Pond. And uh, today we're answering your questions on Tree ID. So thanks, everyone, for providing such a great list. I think we received near about 40 questions uh, that folks offered as they registered, and we'll, we'll try to hit as many as, as we can today. Um, and then, like Maya said, there'll be a block of time at the end where we can uh, do more question and answer through the Q&A portal. So let's jump in. Um, and we had a few questions about uh, folks asking for general rules of thumb for tree ID, especially in winter. So as we've done on these in the past, we'll start with some tree ID basics. Um, you know, these will be helpful as you hear us describing features of uh, the trees today, but also helpful poking around your woods on your own. Um, and so to, so to review, we'll, we'll look at the parts of the twig, branching patterns, um, leaves and needles, and bark characteristics. So uh, let's get started with uh, parts of the twig. Um, the, this will actually be really helpful for another question asker who uh, said they find it especially hard to identify tiny saplings, and they'd like to get better at that. So some of these features are going to be critical in looking at young trees. So if we look at a twig, you can take any live branch um, on that tree and it'll have buds along the sides and one at the very tip. So the buds are where next year's leaves are gonna emerge for growth in the spring. And the bud on the end is called the terminal bud because it's on the terminus of the twig. The buds on the sides are called lateral buds. Um, beneath all these buds, there'll be a leaf scar, which is the mark where the the leaf was attached to the twig before it fell off in the fall. So the shapes of these buds and sometimes the leaf scars can be very distinctive um, and are often a primary indicator to what species you're looking at or at least what species group. And we'll be looking at uh, different buds um, and probably some leaf scars on the species we talked about today. The next thing we wanna focus on is branching pattern or branching structure. Um, this is important. Um, especially again, if you're looking at saplings. Um, buds and leaves are arranged on a branch in a certain pattern. So they're either opposite, which means that they're located directly across from one another, or they're alternate, which means they're staggered along the twig. Um, some species of trees have an alternate pattern, others have the opposite pattern. They don't, they never switch. It's always the same uh, for each species. Um, a trick to remember which trees are opposite is a, is a mnemonic uh, madcap horse, where mad stands for maples, ashes, and dogwoods. Cap stands for caprifoliaceae family, which is mostly shrubs and vines. And uh, horse stands for horse chestnut trees, which um, aren't native to Vermont. So we'll really be focusing mostly on um, maples and ashes today. You can also talk a bit about leaves um, and hardwoods. Leaves can be simple or compound. Uh, a simple leaf is, a, is just a single leaf. It's not divided into smaller parts. It's always attached to the twig by its stem or the petiole, uh, which originates um, from the twig near the bud. A compound leaf, on the other hand, is divided into many parts called leaflets. These are attached by a petiole to the mid vein, um, which is called the rachis, and then transitions down to the petiole connecting to the twig. So if you're unsure, if you're looking at a leaf or a leaflet, you can locate one of those lateral buds on the side of the branch. Um, all leaves, whether they're simple or compound, will have a bud node at the place that the petiole attaches. So on a compound leaf, you can expect to find that bud node, which is just that little tiny bud, um, at the base of each of the, of the stems or the petioles, but no bud node at the base of the leaflet. Also, some common parts on the leaves. Um, leaves have veins, so uh, they have different venation patterns. Thanks, Peter. Um, so you can see how, um, on, on the example on the left, that simple leaf has a mid vein with other veins radiating off. Now we can go back to the, to the slide that shows the margins. Um, so the edges of the leaves, these have different characteristics as well. Some are smooth, which is also called entire. Some might be wavy. Some have teeth, so these little jagged edges, right? Um, 
or they might have lobes, which are, are really deep valleys or what we call sinuses along the edge of the leaf. And uh, this oak leaf and the silver maple leaf on the right are good examples of these deep cuts, these lobes. And we don't want to forget our conifers. Um, mm -hmm. Those are coming up next. Um, they're in the mix today. Peter's going to be talking about those. Um, they have leaves too. We just happen to call them needles. So they're, uh, they're also called evergreens because they generally don't drop their leaves in the fall um, and they look green year round. Um, to keep it simple for today, we'll break them into three categories. Um, Comb-like, which are spruce firs, scale-like, which are generally cedars, and needle-like, you can think pines, and Peter's gonna be going over examples of these later. Um, we also had a question about uh, learning to identify by bark. Um, this is this can be really tricky for folks, um, but a, a great resource is um, this book that Caitlin turned me on to. It's called Bark, A Field Guide to Trees of the Northeast by Michael Wojtek, and uh, we'll provide a, a link to that in, in the resources that uh, we follow up with. Um, Bark can have lots of different characteristics, right? So it might be platy or it might be peeling. It can be very smooth. It can have lenticels, which are these little pockets uh, that are used for gas exchange. It can have uh, vertical ridges or fissures, which run up and down. You get the idea, lots of variability. It can also be different colors. Um, we'll give you a shot of bark for each tree that we talk about today. Um, but it's important to remember that there's also differences in bark between young trees and mature trees of the same species. So if you're looking at saplings, um, the bark could look very different uh, on those young trees than it does on the mature trees. Um, our next question, uh, kind of general question before we move into the, the species specific questions, um, someone wants to know what are the 10 or so most common trees in Vermont? What am I likely gonna be looking at? So this figure is actually from uh, the US Forest Service 2017 publication, Forests of Vermont. Um, this uh, shows the numbers of trees, individual trees out there, the, uh, the 10 most common. So if we were looking at um, how much wood was out on the landscape by species, this might look a little different, but this is actually numbers of trees. So leading the way, American beech, followed by sugar maple, balsam fir, red maple, striped maple, red spruce, yellow birch, hemlock, white ash, and uh, taking up the rear is uh, paper birch. So we'll focus on many of these today um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into our top 10. We're not gonna count them down backwards like Letterman did, uh, but we're gonna start with ash. So to kick us off, maybe a little bit of audience participation. Um, Maya, can you uh, help us out with the poll? What percentage of trees in Vermont are ash? So it's multiple choice. Uh, for folks who can uh, see that, go ahead and give us a vote. <clears throat> we'll keep that up for a moment. And Maya, I'll let you uh, wrap that up when you see that most of the folks have answered. So percentage of trees in Vermont that are ash, zero to five, five to 17, sorry, five to 7%, 25 to 30% or over 50%. And today's answer is, how'd we do? So we have 48% of folks saying 25 to 30% and 44 saying five to seven. So the, the answer is actually based on that FIA data, five to 7%. So that's 150 million ash trees in the state. Now it's important to note that they're not all evenly distributed. So some places are gonna have more ash, some might not have much at all, um, but it is a com an important component of our forests. And we had questions about ash, both about ash identification, but also several questions about emerald ash borer and what's the future of ash looking like in Vermont? What's the outlook with this invasive species? Um, should I cut my ash? Uh, and then one, one question in particular, uh, 
this, this landowner um, wants to know if they should cut their ash. They have some younger trees that look like beech coming up. Uh, help me identify beech. So David's going to be covering beech in a bit, and I'm going to focus on, on the ash piece. So one thing we do know that um, it is an important time to care about ash, and the three species that we have here in Vermont are white, green, and black, often called brown. Um, well, let's get into some ID. Peter, you can move us ahead. Um, so remember some of those basics we covered, um, leaf off ID, let's start with branching structure. So if we remember the madcap horse, maple, ash, dogwood, ashes are opposite. Uh, so the photo on the right shows those stout opposite branches. Um, the leaf scars on ash are also large and easily seen. Uh, and you can see that those are showing up opposite on the, on the twigs. Um, if you look at the shape of the leaf scar, uh, white ash has this U-shaped scar that wraps around the lateral side bud. So it looks like a smiling, happy white ash tree, a smiley face in there. In comparison, you'll find kind of a sideways D-shape flat line against the lateral bud on both black and green. Um, there's some variability here, but uh, generally these are what you'll see. Um, Another helpful indicator is uh, to look down and are your feet wet or are they dry? If they're dry, it's likely you might be looking at an upland species, white ash. If they're wet or if you're standing in a wetland, you might be trying to determine um, green ash or black ash. Although we should note that green is often commonly uh, planted as an ornamental. Um, those black ash buds are uh, really jet black, like a chocolate chip or a Hershey's Kiss, while the other two are more of a buff brown color. And you'll note that uh, that terminal bud, remember that end bud on the black ash, it sits up on a little stalk. So there's a space between that and the first set of side buds, the lateral buds, unlike white or green where things are pressed right up together. Um, let's look at the leaves of ash. Ash leaves are compound, which means this whole thing is one leaf. Um, and they're typically made up of five to nine leaflets. White ash uh, tends to have clearly stalked leaflets. So you can see that little petiole that connects the leaflets to the main stalk. Um, and white ash has light colored whitened undersides, which is how it gets its name. Um, the leaflets of green ash have short little stalks connecting them into that center rachis. The undersides are, are darker without that whitish appearance. And the leaflets of uh, black ash are what's called sessil, meaning they have no stock. The leaf is connected directly to the rachis, or the leaflet rather, is connected directly to the, the rachis. They have a few more leaflets, so seven to 11. Uh, the shape can vary. You can see that they're looking oval here, um, but they also can be uh, long and skinny. And bark, we promised bark for, for uh, most folks interested in that. So white and green really can be kind of challenging and mature trees both have ridges or fissures that tend to take on these diamond shapes. I feel like green ash might have a bit more of a finely laced pattern, but a lot of this has to do with the site conditions of where the tree's growing and uh, how happy it is, like what the, what the growth rate and vigor of that individual tree is that can really influence the bark. Um, black ash bark is much different. It's really flaky and quirky and spongy to the touch. And if you find a good one in the woods, um, it's really one of my favorite things to, uh, to, to grab and um, play with. And to close, uh, the future of ash in Vermont. So many of us know that uh, ash is under attack by an invasive non-native beetle, the emerald ash borer. And so obviously this creates uncertainty, uh, but we do know it's an important time to care about ash and learn to identify it for just that reason. So all of our ash species will really be dramatically impacted by EAB. Um, and EAB is really found in almost every corner of the state now. Um, we could do a full webinar on this topic alone, but I'm gonna try to give you the two minute primer. Um, because of these EAB impacts, that bark we're talking about is, is probably going to look very different soon if, it, if it's not already in your neck of the woods. Woodpeckers are going to cause this, this feature we call blonding, where they flake away the upper ridges of the bark um, and expose the light, uh, the light bark color underneath. Um, and they're doing that while they're looking for the EAB larvae. So they're flicking away 
that bark. You can see it a little bit um, starting on those two center trees in the upper middle. And then on the photo to the upper right, you can really see that, that light color blonding showing up well. As we pull away the bark there, you can see the S-shaped galleries that the larvae are making during their feeding. This is actually what's killing the tree by eventually girdling it and cutting off all, all the, the transport system for food and water. Um, and that little white grub in the bottom left, that's the larvae that turns into the emerald ash or beetle uh, directly above it, uh, which is about a quarter to a half inch long. Um, they feed on ash leaves during the summer before laying their eggs under the bark again, starting that process all over. Um, management questions. Should I cut my ash? Well, the answer is it depends. There's obviously no one correct answer for every landowner or every area of the woods, but it is time to start planning for ash uh, in EAB. Um, if you have a consulting forester, work with them to discuss your options. Contact your county forester to think about getting a planning process. Uh, or if you're a VLT conserved landowner, you can contact one of the four of us uh, on the webinar today. Our friend Tony D'Amato at UVM likes to say, manage for the forest, not the insect. So meaning to work with a, a healthy and diverse forest ecosystem, um, which may include cutting some ash, but don't only focus on the bug. The upshot is really, if you choose to harvest, there's some things you can do to manage for the long-term health of ash. There really is hope um, in this, what is otherwise a pretty bleak projection. Um, we know that the impacts in Vermont are gonna be really severe, uh, as in other states where up to 99% of ash is killed by EAB. But in Michigan, researchers are finding some white ash trees are recovering from EAB. Um, you might have heard of these lingering ash or survivor ash, and there's efforts underway to, to look at that genetic resistance. So things are gonna change for ash. Um, some folks have heard me say this before perhaps, but that last photo on the lower right might look like the sun setting on ash here in Vermont. But I do believe that there's hope. There's things that we can, we can do uh, by working with our foresters, uh, management strategies and keeping ash on the landscape, thinking about resistance. And I happen to know that that photo was taken at six in the morning. So I look at this as a new day coming for our ash. Um, and I think I'm gonna transition here over to Caitlin, who's gonna talk about another uh, oppositely oriented species uh, in that madcap horse, uh, mnemonic maple. Awesome, thanks Dan, well said. Um, and everyone, I hope you don't mind. I am going to uh, keep my video off just to save a little bandwidth here. Um, so I'm Caitlin. I live in Bristol with my husband and daughter featured there in the, in the photo. And so Maya, if you don't mind launching our next poll, here we go. So here's a timely question given we're right on the verge of sugaring season here in Vermont. So which species can you tap to make syrup? I'll give you, give, we've got five options up there, sugar maple, red maple, Norway maple, black birch, or all of the above. So I'll give you a couple seconds to answer, enter your, your answers. Great, all right. All right, excellent. So our, our most popular choice was all of the above, followed by sugar maple and then Norway and black birch. So the answer is all of these species. Um, although the sugar content and or flavor may differ, maples, birches, and actually walnuts um, are all capable of generating enough pressure in their stems to move, to move water uh, when they don't have their leaves. So this pressure is what causes sap to flow from a tap hole which is here, we've got our bucket hanging on, and sufficient quantities to be harvested and processed into syrup. So we're gonna start, as Dan said, with the maples. There are six native species of maple found in Vermont, as well as the non-native Norway maple. And all of them, as we just learned, can, which seems like most of you knew, could be tapped to produce syrup. Uh, so several folks have written in asking us specifically to talk about these three. So the first one on the left, red maple, the bark of which this is all young, younger trees. Um, the bark is, is smooth. It almost has a silver kind of co color to it. And as it ages, 
the texture and color changes. And you'll see in this photo, the bark is starting to crack. Um, so the term another person was wondering um, if uh, the difference between soft and hard maple. So the term soft maple, it doesn't refer to any specific species of maple, uh, but rather it's, it's more of a broad term that includes several different species depending on where you live. So here in Vermont, uh, when people say soft maple, they're generally referring to the commercial species red maple. It's still strong, so don't, don't be fooled by that name, uh, especially compared to some other types of wood. It can be used for furniture, musical instruments, boxes. It's just soft in relation to hard maple, which brings us to sugar maple, our state tree in the middle. You can see here, its bark is a little more sort of gray, brownish gray compared to the silver of, of uh, red maple. Michael Wotek, who Dan mentioned, uh, has really the best description that I appreciate is the surface, as you can see, has a subtle pattern to it like old paint. So you can see this sort of gentle uh, pattern in the bottom photo there. So it's also called hard maple, rock maple, you may, for, may hear people refer to it as. Uh, it is a very strong wood, uh, can be used for flooring, bowling pins, pole cues, pole, excuse me, pool cues, butcher blocks, and other things. So it's, it's really good for these type of uses because of that, you know, increased strength. And then we'll wrap up this slide with Norway maple, our, our non-native maple. Uh, the young bark is, is smooth, uh, as many young trees are. Uh, and it starts to develop these sort of, you'll see these narrow vertical cracks uh, that have more of a little bit of an orange tint to them. So those are when, when these trees are younger. And then uh, I put here some of the more mature um, bark for these species. And, and for those of you who may have joined us for last year's Winter Tree ID webinar, uh, this is a review. So I've removed the labels so you can kind of test yourself as we go along. Um, so as, as, a tree, as a tree ages on the left, you'll see these vertical cracks are starting to develop and they form these long, kind of vertical strips. And then below that, you'll see on, on the tree below it, those vertical strips start to curl on both ends. And this, uh, for those of you who guessed it, this is red maple. And then if we move on to the tree in the middle, um, as this tree grows, the new layers of bark push out and the bark starts to develop uh, vertical cracks. As a tree gets much older, ridges can develop. And, and they start to peel off in these long vertical plates. So this is our, this is our state tree sugar maple. And then, you know, you, you, you've probably gotten there by now. Um, the one on the right is Norway maple. And the pattern of sort of the narrow and shallow vertical ridges, they start to intersect. And, and you know, it looks a lot like white ash. Some Norways, you know, have a more clear diamond pattern to the bark like ash than others, which, you know, it makes it kind of tricky because they're also oppositely branched. Um, so in this case, find a bud or if they're too high up, you can look up and just really look at the branches. Uh, ash have a lot more stout branches um, that, are, that are thicker than maple. So that can be another way to, to distinguish the two. So again, red maple on the left, sugar in the middle, and then Norway on your right. So looking next at the buds, our first one on the left, it's you know this round, bright red colored bud. Uh, it's the first, one of the first trees to, tree buds to open in the spring. And so that, the bright red, that's the dead giveaway there. That's your red maple bud. And in the middle, this tree has, it has more um, numerous brown scales to the bud. And you'll see on this photo, which these are all images from the Northern Forest Atlas, which is a great resource. Um, and you'll see these tiny little hairs. The bud has a pointed tip, which I like to remember is like the many um, church steeples here in Vermont. So this is our state tree. This is, this is a sugar maple bud. And then on your right, you'll see the Norway maple terminal bud. It's more of a maroon color, not quite as bright red as the red maple. The scales overlap. It's more of a rounded end, especially when you look at compared to sugar maple. Uh, and the bud is, is larger. It's definitely a stockier bud than your sugar maple or red maple bud. So again, red on the left, sugar in the middle, and then Norway on the right. 
so I included leaves because, well, spring's going to be here before we know it. Um, so I'll do a quick review here for those, those of you who, who are interested. So red maple, you'll see on the left, that, that, that tends to have these V-shaped sinuses. So Dan talked about sinuses and lobes. And there's teeth along the edge of the leaf. Whereas in the middle, sugar maple has, um, doesn't have any teeth. That uh, main lobe in the middle, the, is the sides of it are parallel. And then you have these sort of U-shaped sinuses uh, that I said are smooth. So think of that in terms of uh, sugar maple. And then uh, Norway maple on the far right, it looks a whole lot like sugar maple, so can pretty easily con confused. Uh, if you see it early in the spring, a tree that's uh, leaves are coming out pretty early or retain later in the fall, that can be one way to tell it's a Norway. There is a cultivar that's planted pretty uh, regularly called the Crimson King. And that has really a, a deep burgundy color to the leaf. That is a, a Norway maple cultivar. The leaves tend to be wider um, than sugar maple, but the real test is if you break off, so in that sort of small picture on the right, if you break off a leaf, there's a, a milky sap that's exuded um, instead of the clear slap, sap from our, our native sugar maple. So that's sort of a good telltale sign you have a Norway maple. And then down below, you'll see, you know, I've, I've the, these are Samaras, you helicopters as kids. Um, I know we all referred to those. So they're paired seas with wings um, and the fruit really varies in size and color and, and the angle um, between the two, two wings. So someone had asked um, about specifically about Norway maple and if they should remove it. So Norway, it's native to Europe and Western Asia and was first introduced into the US around 1750 as an ornamental, quickly became a popular street tree um, and still is today. I know Bristol has several um, in our, on our, one of our main streets, but it can escape into the woods and is considered to be invasive um, and will outcompete sugar maple. So the most compelling argument for me for removing non-native invasive plants like Norway maple um, involves the research of Doug Ptolemy that has shown that native plants support a higher percentage of insect biomass than non-native vegetation. So you'll see here, there are two graphs showing one, the one on the left, the amount of caterpillar biomass on native, that's the, late, the light blue bar versus non-native plants, that's the dark blue. And then the richness, which is the graph on the right, which is the number of different species of insects on native, again, the light blue bar versus non-native, which is the dark bar. So you'll see in the next slide that our native maples support hundreds of Lepidoptera. So these are our moth and butterfly species, uh, which in turn are an important food source for migratory and resident songbirds and many other wildlife. So insects, which the late E.O. Wilson calls the little things that run the world, really are, you know, the base of the food web. Um, so this, this is one of the really compelling reasons that I, I do non-native invasive plant um, control is because of these, these little things that run the world. So if we move on to the next slide, I'm going to switch gears really quickly because a question came in about American sycamore. So American sycamore platinus occidentalis is uh, found in the Cham Champlain Valley. Here we're sort of more at the northern end of its natural range. It's common on wet soils such as stream banks or in floodplains. If you want to see a, a bunch of it growing together in the floodplain of the New Haven River, come to Sycamore Park in Bristol. Um, you'll see some a lovely stand of, of sycamore. So it's a big tree. Uh, I made the pilgrimage to visit the buttonball tree, which is an American sycamore growing in the small village of Sunderland, Massachusetts. And it is over 113 feet tall with a crown width of 140 feet and a little over eight feet in diameter. And it's still growing. Uh, I highly recommend a pilgrimage. Give it a hug when you go visit it. It's quite an amazing tree. A uh, plaque at its base indicates it's germinated sometime before 1787. Many people argue it's possibly as much as 400 years old. So pretty impressive tree. Sycamores can get really big. Uh, the bark 
Um, so in the next slide, we'll see the bark, you know, there's really nothing like it. It's, it's so distinctive. It's got more of a camouflage look to it. You have this sort of model dark outer layers um, of bark that peel away to reveal this sort of white, these white layers underneath. Some of the other features, um, not as showy, are the twig is, um, has a zigzag pattern to it, and that bud is kind of stout. It's not it's kind of a nondescript bud. Um, the leaf looks a lot like a maple leaf, um, but without, particularly red maple, but without the teeth. Um, and then the fruit is this, the, for American sycamore, it's about a quarter and a half inches in diameter and it's held singly on a, a long stalk. And you can see them, you know, hanging out in the trees in the, in the winter. It's um, pretty cool. So for my final slide to wrap up sycamore, sycamore, I would be remiss without talking about, oh, let me, before I jump there, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Um, someone was wondering how hardy American sycamore is. And uh, there's a lovely poem by Wendell Berry called The Sycamore. And I would say Wendell, he would argue it's very hardy. Uh, so while the natural range um, is limited to the Champlain Valley, it is commonly cultivated um, as far north as zone 4B. So that's the dark blue in this, uh, in this map. You know, it's tolerant of drought, poor drainage, and higher pH soils that you, you'd find in more urban environments. It's, it's kind of moderately tolerant to salt um, and can suffer some cold injury if we have some harsh winters. So again, we're at the northern end of its range, so not as hardy necessarily in terms of um, cold temps. Uh, you know, and so while it is fairly tolerant, you know, it really does grow best in deep, rich soil that is moist but well drained. Uh, and don't forget the butterball tree. Sycamores can get really big. So if you do want to plant a sycamore, make sure that you have a planting site with, with plenty of space. So I'll wrap up just mentioning um, something about the London plane tree, which is a hybrid between American sy sycamore and a, an Asian species, Platinus orientalis. Uh, this one is widely planted, including here in Vermont. Uh, so I just wanted to mention it. It differs uh, from American sycamore, and you can identify it because its fruit has two to six balls per stalk, whereas American sycamore is just one. It's smaller, um, and London plane tree has a it's a shorter stalk um, that attaches to the to the fruit ball. So the leaves do look a lot like maple leaves. Um, they tend to have a little deeper lobes than American sycamore, um, but that can be a little bit tricky to differentiate. So I will wrap up there and pass it off to David, um, who will cover beach. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'll just jump right in. Time's whipping by here. Um, so we had a bunch of questions about beach come in. So I thought it would just be good to review it. Now we can talk about beach park disease and, and the wildlife benefit of this tree. Um, so. Beech is a great tree. It's a prominent tree in our forests. Um, yeah, go back one. Um, Peter, if you can go back, there you go. If you look on the left there, it's the characteristic smooth gray bark. Um, it was funny, I just never thought of this, but a, a young person told me the other day, think about elephant skin. So, um, that's a great way to think about it. Now the next tree over in that slide um, that has the cankers and stuff, that's another common site. And we'll talk about that later. That's the beach bark disease causes those, but you see the color is still the same and so on. So switching to the leaf, the leaf um, has this parallel venation, kind of distinct. There's a few other trees that have that kind of pattern, but um, not many. And if you look on the edge of the, um, of a leaf, it is actually called double, doubly serrated. So it's kind of saw toothy. That's important, um, helping with other trees, distinguishing it. And um, the bud is also uh, pretty unique. And especially this time of year, or even a little closer to spring, um, if you catch it in the right sun, uh, like lighting with the sun and stuff, it'll be almost be orangey. And uh, it's about half inch long, very lancelet shaped. Um, another 
which I find the buds actually is really, really helpful, um, especially this time of year, if you've got seedlings and that kind of stuff. Um, you can at least eliminate the beach out of out of the mix if um, if you're trying to ID everything. The leaf also um, is very persistent. Um, botanists call this marcescence, where it's it actually dies, but it stays on the tree, very similar to oak. Um, you'll see this. So if you're out, you know, even out this morning taking the dog out, I mean, I can look down through the northern hardwoods, and you can pick out the beech tree trees pretty quickly. Um, there's a lot of debate on why this happens. Um, the one that sort of made the most sense to me is that, you know, this beech tree and like oak that also does the same thing, you know, they, they can grow on some pretty, pretty rough sites, um, can be dry, shallow soils, not as rich. And, you know, these leaves dropping later can be rotting and then give this flush of organic matter in the spring when it's really needed. Um, but the big, uh, Let's see, um, the big thing about this, so the beach, in terms of, uh, um, you know, lumber or value and that kind of stuff, it's, it's not, not a lot of uh, demand for the boards. The lumber is really difficult to dry. Um, in Europe, they figured it out pretty well with the European beach, it's a little more stable. Uh, but here in the US, there's just, um, just isn't much market for, uh, for lumber. So really the big value is, um, is for the beech nuts and for the wildlife. So next slide. Um, if you notice when we, on this, you can see the beech nut is right in the middle. It's kind of a, it's like as big as your thumb. It's got a little uh, hairy husk and it opens with three sort of petals. And then they have these two triangular shaped nuts in there. Um, really neat if you, if you can find them in the fall and, and really look at them. Uh, but a lot of wildlife uses them, and, and particularly the bear. Um, the beech nut is a real high calorie nut. And uh, it's actually, I just learned a great source of potassium and manganese, which, which I found interesting. So if you notice on the, this, the picture on the right, the, the bears will actually climb the tree. Um, and because the bark is sort of thin and it scars easily, you'll have years of these, um, of claw marks going up. And uh, again, you know, if you see that from a distance, you know right away it's a beach. So anyway, the bears will climb up in the tree, um, get as high as they can, and then they'll start pulling in the tops and the finer branches with the nuts and start feeding. And then, unfortunately, I've never seen this, but what I'm told is, and they tuck these branches in underneath them and make what looks like a nest. Um, so we refer to those as bear nests, but they're not, you know, really nests for anything else besides sitting up there. And it's a little hard to see, but that slide on the right, um, there's a nest up in a tree and that was up um, about 65 feet. And from the ground, um, it looked to be, you know, three or four feet around and pretty impressive. And the top of that tree above that nest was just decimated. So not sure how good that will be moving on. Um, the beach, uh, the trees really start producing nuts around 40 years old. Um, and on a two year cycle. So they have a really good cycle over abundance. And then the next year there'll be just a few, you'll only find a few beech nuts scattered around. Um, environmental factors also play a huge role with this tree. So like a, a late frost, um, if you had a drought or a really dry summer that can impact it. Um, obviously disease, a beech bark disease. And, uh, and just weird, you know, like if we had a cold summer, you know, overcast and stuff, little things like that can affect the, the quantity of the crop. Okay, next one, Pete. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then of course, it's just an example of the, of the bear nest. Um, I, when Dan sent this to me, I was like, there's no way that's Photoshop, but I did some research and I think it's real. Um, but this was actually down in Florida. There's an heron, heron rookery and a bear climbed up in one of their nests. So I thought it was pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's move on to beach bark disease. So unfortunately, um, and you can go to the next slide. Yeah, um, many of the beach trees in the Northeast suffer from beach bark disease. Um, and beach bark disease in an insect fungus complex caused by beach scale insect and then a canker fungus. So basically under this white, um, 
the picture on the left there and the, the white is the scale insect. And that's making, you know, it's got a little uh, sucking part or whatever that will penetrate that bark, make a tiny little wound, and then this fungus comes in behind it. Um, not always. I mean, you can find a tree like the tree on the right there has this um, scale on it, but it's at this point not infected yet by the, the, the fungus. And then, if, but if you see, um, I think it's sort of midsummer towards the fall, um, if you see this red fruiting body stuff going on, um, that middle slide that's like the size of about a quarter, then you know your tree's an infect is, has been infected by it. And if you remember several slides ago, you had that one tree with a lot of those small cankers. Those those can get quite um, quite pronounced. And uh, yeah, there you go. And they'll get bigger and then canker on canker. And eventually that does, um, it'll girdle the tree and kill the tree. And a lot of the trees are getting infected before they can start throwing seed. Um, so what's, let's see, go to the next one, Peter. The, uh, it, the uh, fungus came in um, from Nova Scotia and you know, around the turn of the century has just been slowly uh, moving west. In fact, in the 80s, I, I think it was most of Ohio hadn't been infected yet, but it's, it's pretty well infected now. Um, but what's neat is we're finding trees that are naturally resistant to the scale insect. Um, so from a management perspective, and certainly for in, in the forestry world, it's pretty easy to see them. You get out there and you'll find one that's all cankered up and not looking healthy. And then you'll have a nice smooth bark, we call them beach, um, and they can get quite large. And so typically we'll, um, we'll try to harvest or you know, get weed out the, the real diseased ones, retain the, the resistant ones, hoping some of that genetic material will be passed on. Um, but it is really impacting. There's places up in Maine where you, know, you don't, to find a, a, a disease-free beach is pretty hard. So, um, so this kind of leads into the next, um, we had a couple questions interestingly on um, American chestnut tree, which <clears throat> I found this, this map, this is from the American Chestnut Foundation, which um, is doing a great job to try to reintroduce this tree. Um, I think this map's a little uh, conservative, I always sense felt that there were more trees in southern Vermont or more chestnut trees um, earlier on. But you can see it wasn't a, a huge tree for, for us, um, but it was a very prominent tree in the rest of the east. Um, you know, it grows fast, it grows big. The wood was uh, used for uh, just a number of things, like my father-in-law's barn, uh, post and beam barn was all chestnut, uh, chestnut beams. Um, the nut was just a uh, incredible food for a lot of different wildlife. Um, and, uh, but again, turn of the century came and um, a blight was introduced and it pretty much wiped the tree out. The other thing too, is we weren't really thinking about longevity of this tree or the tree species on the landscape. And a lot of it was cut out was salvaged um, without any thinking ahead of time. So there might have been some natural resistance. The Chestnut Foundation is working on that, crossbreeding, and so on. Um, so uh, I think that was it on the on the chestnut. But if you want to learn more, definitely go to the American Chestnut Foundation. They have a great resource. So just a quick look at the the leaf. The leaf can be confused. It is in the um, beech family. Um, but again, you won't, you won't find, find it around. Um, it is pretty much extinct, um, but the blight can't get into the roots. So it's almost like a woody shrub now. Um, definitely see it. I've seen it down in Connecticut, Massachusetts, growing in places. Um, and now you'll, um, what you'll see, uh, the, you know, nurseries and stuff are, are selling either the Chinese, Japanese, or European chestnut. So you will see those around as yard trees. Um, if you buy chestnuts at the grocery store, they're usually U European. Okay, next one. So we had some questions on cherry, and uh, these are great questions because I uh, sometimes get get a little confused on the cherry also, and had to really look into it. So in the in the state, we mainly have pin cherry and 
black cherry. Um, and I'll just talk about pin cherry first. So pin cherry is really what we consider an early successional species, meaning that it comes in after major disturbance, it grows fast, it grows in thickets, and its job is to build up some organic matter, create some shade and let some other species come in behind it. Um, sometimes called fire cherry, it's really common to come if an area has been burned. Um, the best way to tell this, and it, again, it can get a little confusing, is to look at the bark. And the one on the left is really, um, is really a great one, it has those horizontal lenticels. Um, and you can see on the right, bar, right hand one, it, they're not quite as pronounced. Um, so it can get a little tricky. But if you happen to be around when the flowers are blooming, um, the pin cherry comes in a cluster. And uh, that's another way to tell. And they don't get, um, you won't see a large tree. They, these don't get, you know, if, if you see one eight or nine inches in diameter, that's a that's an old, old pin cherry. They usually only get about 30 feet tall. Um, and they definitely grow in thickets. Um, which black cherry can too a little bit, but um, not so much as a pin cherry. So, and people often refer to it as a weed tree, that kind of stuff, but it has a great wildlife component. The cherry is um, utilized by a lot of birds and stuff. Okay, next slide. Uh, let's see. Um, so looking at black cherry, now black cherry is a very valuable lumber tree. Um, it grows quite large, long lived. Um, and you can see, the uh, the pattern of it, the one on the left, it just I like to look at from a distance of trees a lot, and it's just characteristic. It's very dark, a lot of fine branching going on, sort of gnarly looking. Um, it's also very susceptible to ice damage, and I, I just call it dieback. I don't know if that's the right term. So a lot of times you look up and say, "Oh man, this tree's dying. There's something wrong with it," and it'll be that way for 20 or 30 years. Um, it doesn't mean you have to get out there and salvage it right away. Um, the bark on the, the black cherry is uh, much platier. It's not, it's not that nice smooth, although when it's really young, it can be smoother, but it'll quickly start breaking into these, um, this platiness and they're, they're, they're kind of fine plates, um, but it's definitely a rougher bark compared to the pin cherry. And they'll be much, you know, if you found, <clears throat> found one that was like nine inches and the bark's looking a little rough, then you're pretty, pretty sure it's, it's a black cherry. Um, and again, if you're around when it's flowering, this um, flower is in more of this uh, sort of stocky, it's, I think it's called a racine. Um, it's got lots of little, little flowers. Um, it's not that bunch of them. And um, again, the, the, the cherry is very valuable as a wildlife food. And the next one to the, look at the next slide is a comparison. So <clears throat> I didn't go a whole lot on leaf shape because I found the leaf shape as being very difficult. Um, but the one on the right, the pin cherry, that's the classic pin cherry, um, where the black cherry is sort of a, a thicker, less lancelet shaped leaf. And you can see the difference in the bark. And then, um, you know, if you have a hand lens, you can look at the, the buds too. Um, I did throw the slide of the choke cherry in. People often throw this in with the mix, but um, choke cherry is a shrub. Um, it does have berries and, and so on, but it, it's not anything really related. Um, let's see. Okay, um, we can jump to the next one. <clears throat> so we did have some questions about um, mycorrhizal fungi and and along those lines. Um, and I don't want to. I mean, <laughs> you could spend multiple webinars on this, but a lot of this has come to light. I mean, there's been research going on this for for a long time, but I think it was never pulled together as, as well as it has been lately. And Suzanne Samars, who's a researcher out of the Pacific Northwest, has just turned out some great research and then wrote this um, uh, just a easy to read and understand book um, called Finding the Mother Tree and uh, certainly recommend it to folks. Um, and looking at the, the scatter graph here, if this is just based on Doug fir, so the big green ones are the the Doug fir trees, and then just two species of fungus, and look at the interconnectedness of all that. And I just, I, I can only imagine if you could do this for, like, you know, if you took an acre and you took all the different tree species, and um, and tried to map all that would just be incredible. So, I think for me, it it really drives home that interconnectedness of all the living 
living matter out there below below ground. Um, and just, I, I think, just really exciting going forward. It's kind of, you know, forcing a lot of people to look at things a little differently. Um, one thing I have uh, had a couple comments from folks. Um, they're talking about the mother tree, and that um, I think it's important to know that, you know, the mother tree dying or harvesting or whatever, you know, you want to do it there. It's not going to kill that mycorrhizal network. Um, there's a lot of factors going in that. In fact, there's been some cool re uh, research recently about the impact of my uh, mammals and insect have on moving spores around and, and developing this network. Um, but actually what's more of a threat to this network are invasive species. Um, Tony D'Amato out of UVM, um, I think he co-authored, I can't remember if he did it or, or was a co-author, um, the effect of um, earthworms on sugar maple. And they're very destructive to this mycorrhizal network going on and other um, invasive plant species. So a lot to learn, um, but pretty neat to, to think about all this stuff going on. And I think that's it. So I will turn this over to Peter. Great, thanks, David. Um, Maya, if you can, we'll throw the, the poll up. Uh, we had a lot of questions from folks about um, the conifers in Vermont. Um, a lot of folks wanted to know um, how to tell the difference between spruce and fir or fir and, and hemlock or how to tell the difference between a bunch of different spruces. And so I guess I'd like you to look out your window and, and see what kind of conifer uh, grows in your neighborhood. What do you see? Um, we'll let that stay up for a while. For me in downtown Brattleboro, it's pretty much nothing. And since I'm sharing my screen, I can't see how the um, it's going, but maybe when the time comes by, you can close that out when it looks like folks have, a bunch of folks have answered and we'll see the results. Here we go. A lot of pine, spruce, hemlock, nice fir. A few people didn't know. And if, only a few with no softwoods at all. Um, only hardwoods are interesting. Thanks for taking that poll. <clears throat> um, so we're going to start off with the spruces. Uh, there are three native spruces here, red, white, and black. And one way to start to think about or figure out um, <clears throat> which one you're looking at is to think about where you are on the landscape. Um, red spruce is a little bit of a generalist. It can be in wet or dry sites. Um, white spruce is a, a more of a dry site species. So old pastures and well-drained soils, you'll find uh, white spruce and black spruce is gonna be in wetlands. It's gotta have its feet wet. Um, so if you're in a swamp, it may be black spruce. And another thing to look at is the growth form, which we can see here. The red and the white are fairly similar, um, but the black is really different. You have that funky little cluster of branches right at the top. So if you're in a wetland and you see that really funky growth form, then you know uh, <clears throat> it's black spruce. Um, so one way to think about or try to differentiate between whether you're looking at white pine or, or excuse me, white spruce or another spruce is to know where you are in the state. So the native range of white spruce is really about the top quarter of the state. You may find some scattered around, or there may be some plantings and some, uh, plantations or something like that. But generally, white spruce is only found in the northern part of the state. So if you're not there, you're not looking at white spruce. Um, and let's move on quickly to some of the sort of basics. So Dan talked before about uh, classifying conifers in three ways, the comb-like, needle-like, and scale-like foliage. So the spruces fall into the comb-like 
uh, classification. They have round needles as opposed to balsam fir and hemlock, which are comb-like but have flat needles, and we'll get to those in a minute. So um, <clears throat> the red spruce so shown on the left is sort of uh, average in terms of size, um, in terms of the needles and the cones, the white spruce tends to have bigger cones, longer needles, and the black is the opposite, smaller cones, smaller needles. Another thing about uh, black spruce is that the, the scales on the cones are toothed. The scales on the other two cones are smooth. Um, and one way to tell them apart is the amount of, of hairs on the twigs. Um, the white spruce is smooth, red, has a few twig, a few hairs on the twigs, and the black is, is really hairy, which we'll see in the next slide. So I wish this was up on a really big screen for everybody. I don't know how big your screen is, but if you look really closely on the right-hand slide, sort of halfway up, you can see a few hairs on that twig. <clears throat> the white spruce is completely smooth, and it's pretty obvious the black spruce, how hairy that is. So that's a good way to tell the spruces apart. And one way <clears throat> to tell whether you have a spruce or some other conifer is to look at the way that the needles are attached to the twig. And you look at these, all the needles are attached to the twig by a little wooden peg. You look at the, where those red arrows are pointing. Um, that's unique to spruce. If you see the needles on the, on the tree you're looking at are attached directly to the twig, it's not a spruce. If it has that little wooden peg, then it's a spruce of some sort. And you can sort of work your way to back from there. Um, so, uh, like I said, a few people wanted to know how to tell the difference uh, between spruce and <clears throat> balsam fir. Oh, wait a minute, there was one other question I can't, shouldn't forget. Um, so someone wanted to know how uh, red spruce, how to tell the difference between red spruce and Norway spruce, which is not native here, uh, when they are uh, little seedlings or saplings up to about 18 inches. And so um, the best way I would say is to look around at what else is growing in the overstory. If you're in a plantation, then it's probably Norway spruce. If you're out in the woods, uh, Norway spruce generally doesn't escape into the into the woods, it's usually in plantations. So if you're out in the, in the woods, away from plantations, it's probably red spruce. The other thing to look at is the hairiness of the twig again. Uh, the Norway spruce is smooth like the white spruce. Um, so uh, let's see. We're gonna move on now to the comb-like flat needle conifers. Um, both of these, uh, one of the tips that people sometimes give is look for the double white stripe on the underside of the needle. Problem is they both have it. So how do you tell the difference between balsam fir and hemlock? One difference is that uh, these hemlock needles are a little shorter. Uh, these are about a half an inch and these are probably three quarters of an inch to an inch long. To tell the difference between these two is, uh, again, looking at the base of the needles. So it's a little hard to see on this slide um, on the right of the hemlock because hemlock woolly adelgid has infested this poor tree and it's covering. Um, you'll only find those on the underside of the twig and right at the base of the needle. But if we look a little closer, you can see that balsam fir needles are attached directly to the twig. It's like they're suction cupped right to the twig, whereas the hemlocks have a little fleshy stem that attaches the needle to the twig. So that's very different and an easy way to tell the difference between the two. Now we're gonna look at some bark. Um, spruce bark is generally fairly similar across species. Uh, it has uh, sort of a light gray color and these sort of uh, round platelets. Uh, here's another spruce here, which can look fairly similar to the, to the fir on the right. 
Um, the difference is the fur have the little resin pockets. Um, so if you see uh, a tree with those little bubbles and you pop them, a little resin comes out, that's definitely a fir, not a spruce. Um, and like a few other folks have said, this is in some ways a review of other uh, webinars that we've done. So if I'm going through some of this stuff too fast, um, you'll get a link to this webinar when we're done. And there will also be links to the old ones. So if you want to go back and review some of those things, you can. Um, so moving on to the needle-like conifers, those are the pines. The three most common ones are shown here, white, red, and scotch pine. Um, the white pine, uh, white, the, the word has five letters and the needles for white pine, there are five of those in a bundle um, or a fascicle. Um, <clears throat> they're a little shorter than the red pine needles, red pine and Scotch pine both have two needles to a bundle. Um, the Scotch pine are considerably shorter, about an inch and a half to three inches as opposed to five or six, and they're twisted. The cones are very different too. The white pine you see on the right, or excuse me, on the left is about five inches long. Its scales are pretty flexible, whereas the scales on the cones of the other two um, are pretty rigid. Uh, the, the shape of those red and scotch pine cones uh, can be fairly similar. They're a little different in these illustrations. Uh, one thing that uh, one thing that isn't shown real well here is that the um, the scales on the red pine are kind of rounded, whereas they're more angular on the scotch pine. The, the easiest way to tell the scotch pine is really that orange bark that you see in the picture on the right. That is pretty prominent on branches and uh, in the upper part of the tree. And it also has this really funky growth form. You know, if, if Pablo Picasso was asked to illustrate a pine tree, it would look like a scotch pine. The things grow in all kinds of crazy directions. Um, but let's look at the bark of the other pines as well. Uh, the red pine, uh, the red pine is uh, sort of similar in color to the scotch pine, but it's very consistent all the way up. It's not as orangey, and the top of the tree on the scotch pine will get all orange bark. Uh, the red pine is not. <clears throat> um, it looks like this sort of mottled color the whole way up. Um, white pine. Looks like I'm getting some more messages. Okay, it looks like it is working. Good. Um, white pine has uh, a much more, um, much thicker bark. It has sort of thick plates and deep furrows, especially when it gets old. It can look a little bit like hemlock, although hemlock has a browner color and sort of long, thin plates of bark. Um, and you can obviously tell the difference. If you got two right next to each other and you're not quite sure looking at the bark, just look up. If, you, you'll, if it's really sort of wispy looking, you know it's pine. If it's got a really dense foliage, you know it's hemlock. Um, and the last one is the scale-like uh, conifers, and those are the cedars. Um, we have two in Vermont, eastern red and northern white. Uh, the eastern red cedar is actually a juniper. It's generally found in the valleys, uh, Champlain, Connecticut, Vermont valleys, the warmer areas of the state. Um, <clears throat> they both have that sort of scale-like foliage, although the red cedar shown on the left, its juvenile uh, foliage has those really sharp pointy needles. Uh, so that's, that's very different. Uh, another difference is the cones. You can see on the red cedar, the cones grow out at the tips of the, of the branchlets, whereas on the northern white cedar, uh, the cones grow sort of in clusters near the base of the twigs. Um, eastern red cedar also produces a little blue fruit. It looks like juniper because it's in the juniper family. 
um, the northern white cedar just produces a little seed that's inside that cone. And the bark is a little different in that uh, the red cedar bark is really thin and wispy. Um, and the uh, northern white cedar is um, a little bit thicker and wider plates and they will pull right off in strips. Uh, so hopefully most of that came through okay for people. And uh, with that, I think we will move to questions. So Caitlin, who I think are gonna facilitate this part. Yeah, so I think Peter, because of time, we're gonna have Maya kind of wrap us up. And then for those who are interested in hanging on a bit longer, we can uh, work through some of the questions. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, and we will be sending out a survey shortly um, that you should receive in your email inbox along with some um, follow-up resources as well. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and that email will also include a link to our um, website where you can check out some of the other events that we have coming up um, and hopefully sign up to join us at some of those as well. But thanks again for joining us. And again, for folks that would like to stay on, um, we will uh, answer a few more questions, um, but feel free to drop off as well um, and have a great day. Excellent, thanks so much, Maya. And so for those of you um, who are gonna hang out, uh, we can answer some of the questions that have come in through the Q&A while we've been going. Um, so let's see, the first one, let's see, da, 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 da. why don't we do, how about we do one from, uh, read, and I'll sort of throw this out to anyone. So before Vermont was clear cut or, or cleared, you know, for agriculture, what was the ratio of conifer to deciduous trees? Uh, Reed always had it in his mind that conifers were only able to thrive after the clear cut, but I don't know where that idea comes from. So anybody want to tackle that? I'm not sure I have an answer. Uh, I suspect there was quite a bit of hemlock because hemlock is able to grow with uh, sort of a climax species and can grow with quite a bit of shade. Um, I'm not sure how prevalent uh, the other, the pines and the spruces were. There's probably quite a bit of spruce at the higher elevations at the very least um, and in low wetland areas, um, but I don't know the ratio. Do you, either of you? Of you? No, I know Charlie Cogville, um, the ecologist, did a lot of his extensive research on all this stuff. And I know spruce was a much bigger component of our hardwood stands in that example, but um, I don't know numbers. <clears throat> okay, great. Peter, while we're on the topic of spruces, um, Luis is wondering, are spruces currently affected by a fungus? Uh, there are certainly fungi that, uh, that uh, affect spruces. Um, I don't think there's one that is uh, endangering them in any way. There are certainly native funguses that affect them. Um, what do you think, David? I think I've seen some on, on uh, white spruce causing some issues, but nothing major. Yeah, nothing's coming to mind. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose an easy one, and that's from Richard about maples. Richard's wondering, are maples still part of the Acer family? Um, and maples actually, uh, scientists using genetic analysis have uh, reorganized them, and they're now in the soapberry family or the sapindaceae family, which is also a family. Um, there's a lot of tropical species in that family as well, um, but horse chestnuts have also been moved to that family. So, thanks, Richard, for that. Um, and then let's see, this is Dan, this is a question from a Dan. Um, how do you tell the difference between smooth bark hickory and ash in winter? Yeah, so no leaves. Um, I would go right for the 
branching structure. So with ash, you're going to be looking for those opposite branches coming off the twigs, really stout and heavy, and, and hickory is going to be alternate. So staggered, staggered branching. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, I would I would add some of the hickories in our woods have something called phomopsis gall, which is this, it's this big round growth on hickory um, that I've seen it kind of throughout. So that can be another thing to look for that if you see that, then you definitely have a hickory. Um, so let's see. Uh, let me see if I can find one. Um, so David. Let's see, Elizabeth is wondering, they have a big, beautiful Douglas fir at the edge of their clearing. Uh, because of clearing done by our neighbor, we need to plant more conifers to restore the privacy of our setting. Is there a benefit to planting another Douglas fir to foster more underground connections? Um, I tried to answer this online. Um, again, just my gut feeling being a Doug fir versus something native, I would. I would recommend planting something native conifer. And then in terms of the mycelial network and all that, again, I would think the same thing. Um, if you could find something, um, don't know where you are, but you know, if it's a white pine or, or a Northern cedar or something like that would also be beneficial. Awesome, thanks, David. Um, let's see. Here we go. Lisa is wondering, does the eastern cedar develop a disease that damages apple trees? Kind of rust? And everybody's nodding yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <it's> a, <laughs> I, don't, I know there's a cedar apple rust, but it's um, that's um, with red Atlantic red cedar, is that right? Or red cedar? I'd have to, I don't know about northern white. <clears throat> you guys know? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, David. I think it's between uh, red cedar and then apple trees. Um, and so it needs both those hosts in order to complete its life cycle. I believe so. I'd have to look it up. But... Cool. Okay. Um, oh, Alice. Hi, Alice. How common is basswood mm -hmm. in Vermont? <laughs> Who wants that one? <laughs> Did you have something on basswood, Dan? Yeah, I can take that. I mean, I guess I don't know how it's officially categorized uh, as common or uncommon. I think um, you're not going to find it most places. It's very site dependent. So you're only going to find it on those really uh, enriched sites where there's uh, good available nutrients for it. Um, it likes disturbance, so you'll often find it along stone walls or hedgerows or, or other places that have been disturbed. Um, but it's not, un, I wouldn't say it's uncommon to bump into one out there. Um, a, the related question that we had was like, what's a surefire way to identify basswood in the winter? And uh, I think if you can get a, if you can get your hands on the buds, those are really distinctive for basswood. They're, they're, they're pretty large. And uh, when I was in dendrology, what was the, the little trick that was taught to us is that the basswood bud looks like a mouse in a motorcycle helmet. So you have that, you have that kind of beefy bud with the mouse face with a little cap on it, which is the, which is the motorcycle helmet. So um, Google that up. Once you see it once, I don't think you'll forget it. Very distinctive. And I love that. I have not heard that. I always heard the like monk's hood thing. I love the mouse in the motorcycle helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, Karen is wondering, I've noticed that where I have beech trees, there are also hemlocks. Is there a relationship between the two species? Hmm. Who wants that? David or Peter? Well, what about Dan? <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't cover beech or hemlock. Sorry, yeah, Dan, not giving you out on purpose. <laughs> I, mean, I can start in that um, I don't know if there's a relationship in terms of mycorrhizal networks and beneficial um, <clears throat> networks like that, uh, but they are both very shade tolerant. And so um, when you get really heavy shade, you get those two uh, growing together. <clears throat> I think from a site standpoint, they, they could also share some uh, 
some similar sites. Hemlock does really well on wet ground, but also on dry ground, just like beach, very well drained soils. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, let's see, Kevin is wondering, can you discuss the trees in Vermont, which have thorns and the related um, identification? Ooh, this is, that's a good one. All right, rack your brains. Can we think of? <laughs> That, that is a good one. And maybe while you guys are thinking of follow-ups, I'll kick off um, and take the, the Hawthorne question that we had a while back. Um, someone asked if uh, there's any native Hawthorns in our in our region. And I learned some stuff looking this up that I, that I didn't know that. Uh, so Hawthorns are part of the um, Crataegus uh, genus and uh, they're common um, around, around the globe. So there's over 200 species that are native in Europe, Asia, North America, and North Africa. Um, so we do have native hawthorns here. And one fun fact about the name is that um, the haw in hawthorn comes from an old English word for hedge. So it was known as a, as a hedge or a fence with thorns. Hmm. Hard to top that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, I know that there are some honey locusts which are not native to this, to New England, but I know honey locusts are sometimes planted. Um, there is a thorned honey locust, but there's also a thornless cultivar that I think is <laughs> the more widely planted in cities for obvious reasons. Uh, that's one that comes to mind for me. Okay, well, Kevin. Hopefully we gave you enough, but you might've stumped us a little bit. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> well, the only other thing I could think of is prickly ash, which isn't really a tree. It's more of a shrub and it's in the Champlain Valley. It's really nasty to walk through. It's like walking through a barbed wire fence. Great, awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, let's see. So um, here's, Joan has a question about climate change. Uh, this might be a good one to sort of wrap up with. Um, but Joan is wondering, how many of these diseases do you think are the result of climate change? So maybe who wants to, anyone want to tackle sort of what, you know, the impacts of climate change and, and sort of how this may affect diseases and pests and um, Well, I, I don't know how many are a direct result of climate change, but um, I think the concerns go hand in hand, right? So our, our major concern is about our forests and their health and whether they're gonna continue to be able to, to provide the ecosystem functions and all the other resources that we want from them. And as we add on and layer these multiple stresses, that's when we're gonna start to, to really put them to the test. and. Uh, and we could see the, the most kind of dire impacts. Um, so I think whenever we, we layer on these um, non-native uh, funguses or insects, um, which I think are you know, in large part uh, due to our globalization and uh, just the way we move stuff around the world now, um, it's just gonna be an extra stress that's um, gonna be impacting our forests in relation to climate change. Awesome, thanks, Dan. But um, you keep hope alive as you do in, in the case of Ash. So we'll leave on that note. Um, but we appreciate everyone for uh, those of you who stuck with us towards the end here and, and asked some great questions. Um, so we hope you'll join us for some of the upcoming, um, upcoming events. So thanks so much and get out there and uh, start looking at some trees. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> yep, thanks. Thank you.